It's so good to be in the presence of the Lord. If you have your Bibles, can you just turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 1. I'm sure you all know that. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Shall we just close our eyes and pray for a moment? If I have found favor in your eyes, teach me your ways, teach me your ways, that I might be pleasing in your sight. Teach me your ways, teach me your ways. And if you have called me by my name, Teach me your ways, teach me your ways. Oh, that in you I'll always remain. Teach me your ways, teach me your ways. We want to know you, Lord. We want to lift our hearts to your name. And let your presence go with us all of our days. Oh, Lord, teach us your ways. Oh, Lord, teach us your ways. Father, we come to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you for your precious word, the breath of life, our food, our everything. Take it, Lord. Bless it and feed each one of us so that we shall never be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Genesis 1.1 In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The topic of my message today is the glory of God in the creation. And that's creation proclaims the glory of God. When Moses was anointed to write the word, you know, like he started to write the five books of the Bible and it all started with Genesis. And so he, he, he could only go up to the beginning of himself. He said, in the beginning, God. And after that, he just couldn't describe God because where do you start? And like, how do you describe God? He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. How can you describe him? What, what, what else can you say about him? He's so glorious, so powerful, so, uh, so mighty, so, so full of awe and splendor. You know, and, and that is why the book of Isaiah chapter 40 says, you know, where, where God himself says, like, whom can you compare me to? And like, whom can you compare me with? You know, all the nations are but a drop in the bucket. I hold the waters in the palm of my hand. You know, I have called the stars by name. So whom can you compare God to? And many times when, when we sing that song, God is good, yes, God is good, it's fantastic, it feels great. But I feel that we kind of reduce God to good instead of saying God is great. God is truly great and that is why he, he just couldn't find anyone to swear by when he made a covenant with, with Abraham and that's why he had to swear it by himself. He says, I can't find someone to swear upon and therefore I swear upon myself and that I'm going to make you great and mighty on the face of the earth. Now, such a big God, such a mighty God, you know, so awesome and powerful. And just imagine the work of his hands. Obviously, his creation is, 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 is very much going to portray who he is. The creation reflects the glory and the splendor of God. Everything you see, and that's why the Bible says, you, you know, the Bible is full of the majestic description of the work of the hands of the Lord. The Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Look at the waters and look at the floods and look at the, you, you know, the birds of the, of, of the air, the animals, and everything you see is so unique and so powerful and so beautiful. 
when God created, when like he started off his creation, he went into the absolute details. Like he, I mean like he created the day, the night, the animals, the birds, the water, the sky, so on and so forth. Now why, now why should such a great God put so much of emphasis on creating his creation in such avid details? Now that brings to the first point of my message, associated assimilations. God knows very well and that whom you are associated with is going to turn around your, all your assimilations. I mean, you are the product of what you are with. You are the product of your environment. You are the product of who you associate with and what you as as associate with. Your environment influences you. Your environment really defines the end result of how you are going to come out and propel in this world. So he was very clear in how he wanted his creation to be prior to him putting Adam on the face of the earth. Associated assimilations. Take the example of the Hebrews. You know, like when you fast forward the scriptures, you find Abraham and then like God calls him out by name and then he makes him great and famous and mighty and so powerful on the earth, you know. And, and like he does, uh, wonders in, in like Abraham's life through the creation. I mean like when like Abraham was in total doubt and, and, and when faith had kind of drained on him, he took him out to show him the sands on the shore in the day when, and, and when doubt crept in the night, he took him out to see the stars and said, listen, look at the glory of the work of my hands and remind yourself as to what I can do in your life. Associated assimilations. And coming back, when you fast forward a few more years down, you know, like ap approximately around 400 years down, and then you see, you know, the, you know, you will see the Hebrews. They were Hebrews by blood, but, but then because of their associations for 430 years with the Egyptians, even though they were the Hebrews by blood, they started to talk like the Egyptians. I, I, mean, they, I, I mean, they did not talk like Hebrews. They did not walk like Hebrews. They were absolutely slaves because every slave tries to act like their master. And like the Hebrews had become the slaves of the Egyptians. And therefore, they became like the Egyptians in their mentality. Their environment influenced them. And now we need to be careful here because if you need to come out of one slave ma master, you need to be careful that you don't go into the other slave ma ma master. But then unfortunately, the Israelites and the Hebrews were like in a kind of bondage because of the environment they were in. Now many of us here, you know, we could have been put under a lot of prayer, pressure because of the various environments that we have been put under and come through. I'm just not talking about the environments all around us here, but you know, the environment of your family, the environment of a generation, the environment of your childhood, the environment of, of, of a community. You know, just pause for a moment and just think how the environment has shaped you how the environment shapes your belief and your, you know, the way you think and the way you act and the way you do things. You do things because you are associated with that environment. So now what does God do when like he sees you in this kind of an environment and, and, and like especially when he cries out to you for help? God did, decided to bring the Israelites out. God did, decided to bring them out of their current environment into the environment, into the creative world that he had in store for them. And so God said, okay, fine, it's time for you to come out. And that's the same with us. No matter what environment has kind of influenced us in our lives, God wants to bring us out of that environment. So that comes to my second point, abundant magnificence. You know, in a show of 
display. God just shows forth his power in, in might and glory, the way he got the Israelites through the frogs and the flies and the lies and, and, and like all the stuff that God delivered them from. You know, he made them pass through the Red Sea. Like these guys just got out of, of the Red Sea through walls of water. They, they walked out of it and, and, and in front of their very eyes, they saw Pharaoh and the horsemen die. And then they come out. They come out and what do they see in the, in the absolute new environment which God had for them? They saw this huge mountain bursting forth with smoke and fire filled with the wonder, the wonder of the magnificence of God. And there they saw Mr. Moses going into that very mountain to minister. Such a display of power in their very eyes. The abundance of the magnificence of God was there with them firsthand. They experienced it firsthand. God changed their current environment, brought them out into the splendor of his creation, where every part of creation was just echoing out and just, you know, crying out the glory of God. That is what every Israelite saw. That's what every Israelite saw. Then how on earth, I mean, how can they ever go through such a display of splendor and build a golden calf how can you go through such powerful episodes in your life where you saw you witnessed the very glory of God firsthand and then how could you do wrong how can you be so anointed and yet do so much of wrong fast forward According to the gospel re reading which we read to today, the, you, you know, the close friends of Jesus, they were there while the word was at work in their very midst. They saw a repeat of the splendor of, you know, of miracles and deliverance and preaching and wisdom just flowing out of Jesus and multitudes being healed. And then Jesus says, Guys, we want to go on to the other side. Come, let us go on to the other side. The word spoke, let us go on to the other side. And the Bible beautifully records saying they launched out into the boat. So they obeyed him. And these guys were anointed closest to Jesus, closest to Jesus. Their right hand, I mean, they were in the very presence of God himself. And they launched out. Jesus spoke the word knowing fully, word, knowing fully well his word had the power to create the kind of world he wanted. You, you know, the Bible says when, when the world, when the earth was dark and full of void, and Jesus, I mean, God spoke into the world saying, let there be light and there was light. And God saw it was good and it was good. So Jesus spoke the word saying, let us go on to the other side and he just went to sleep. The so, you know, the people who were closest to him, who had just stepped out of that glory moment into the ship, now there was the storm. And they panicked. And what did they say? Master, get up, we are perishing. A few moments back, the glory. And now, they're filled with fear. Christ... Christos or the anointing, the glory, the power, the splendor, the majesty on one side and the environment on the other. Exactly the same even in the time of Israel. The glory, the mountain, the smoke, the fire on one side, the golden calf on the other. How can you deal with contradictions like that? You and me as a Christian, what are we called to do? We are called to conquer the contradictions. And that leads to my third point, which will lead to your final, the awaited victory. Now, how do you conquer these contradictions? You know you're powerful, or you know God is there on one side, and yet on the other side, 
you know, you're just waiting to enter into the realm of victory. So what do you do? See, there are some battles, some, some struggles which like fall off easily. But it is the long ones, it is the long struggles who, who are actually your enemy. Your real enemy is the long struggles that you have to patiently go through. And the answer lies in the reading which was done this morning in the book of Revelations, chapter 8, verse 7. The Bible says, he who overcomes will inherit the things of God. He who overcomes. Now, how do you overcome? You know, the long struggle. See, like, I mean, if, if you read the Bible, David defeated Goliath in a flash. But it was Saul. He, he had to fight long and hard. Joshua defeated the battle at Jer Jericho in an instant. I mean, the walls came tumbling down in front of their very eyes. But he lost the battle of I, AI, because he couldn't identify the sin in his camp. It took God, I mean, it took 40 years for the Israelites to get rid of their golden calves. Sometimes the struggle can be long. But there's always the victory. There is always the victory. You know, it, it took a whole generation. It took a whole generation for God to deliver, to get into the promised land. So then how do we do it? I mean, what do we do? It's very simple. The, the answer is in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Where, you know, God says, be not, you know, be not confirmed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That again goes back to the lesson that we read this morning in the book of Proverbs, where, you know, it says, it talks about wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8. It says, I, wisdom, was there from the very beginning, even prior to the creation of the world, I was there at the right hand of God. So when you face contradictions in your life, what do you do? You tap into that very ancient, that very ancient thing which existed with the ancient of days and that's the wisdom of God. So what will the wisdom of God do? The wisdom of God will point out to God's ways and God's thoughts. And you must understand and, and that the most successful way of, of dealing with any situation is, is knowing how exactly to tap into the answer and to do accordingly. And the answer is there in the will of God. What is the will of God? The will of God is the other thoughts of God. What does God think about this battle? I mean, how do I win this battle? So you enter into the thoughts of God. And, and like, how do you know the thoughts of God? Can you go into God and dissect his brains? No. You get to know the thoughts of God through his word. When you read the word of God, you're reading the thoughts of God. When you meditate the word of God, you're meditating. You're just taking in his ways, his wisdom on how to deal with circumstances. And so, this, and, and so the wisdom for this, you, you, you know, to conquer your contradiction is to transform yourselves by the renewing of your mind. The Bible says, be not confirmed to this world. That is, be not associated with the wrong assimilations. Get out of your environment. Get into the creative environment which God asked you to be. Get into that environment. Get out of the world's way of thinking. Transform your mind and renew your mind. And that's why the Bible, you know, is full of scriptures like, let the weak say I am strong. I mean, how can the weak say I'm strong? It says, let, let, let the poor say I'm rich. And the Bible says, by his stripes you're already healed. The Bible says that you will only give and not borrow, and we will be at the top and never at the bottom. We will only lend to many nations. So, so, so like in moments of frailty, that's what we need to do. Take in the wisdom of God. The first step to conquering your contradiction is to take in the wisdom of God. Rely heavily, bank and chew and meditate. You know, the Bible says in, in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night so that you will observe to do what is written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have great success. 
So when, you, when will you have great success? When the very wisdom of God is embedded in your spirit and all you can see is not the creation but the creator. Point number one to conquering your contradiction. Take your eyes off the creation and place it on the creator. Because the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus in every circumstances, in every contradictory circumstances, where do we look? Off the creation, onto the creator. The disciples, though they had the word living, I mean resting there right in their midst, they had their eyes on the creation, on the storm. And that's why the, their boat was beginning to sink. And what did Jesus do? Simply got, got up and said, peace be still, calm. And then he asked them, why do you fear? I mean, you have seen me do all these mir miracles, so why do you fear? I'm there with you. I'm not going to leave, leave you nor forsake you. And like, it's the same with us today. God said that he's made a covenant of his presence with us. He said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. So looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And how do you do that on a daily basis? How do you conquer your contradictory situations on a daily basis? Simple. Again, go to the scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. It says, casting down every wicked imagination and every thought, take it into captive and cast it down. Cast it down, bring it under the knowledge of God. So what does that mean? Any kind of fear, any thought which comes up, you weigh it with the word of God. What does the word of God say about this? And then what do you do? You, you weigh it. Is this the same according to the word? Yes, then I take it. Otherwise, no. I bring it under the word of God and I pronounce, I declare the word over my storm. And that's what the Lord Jesus did, right? He just got up and he said, peace be still, right? So how do we conquer your contradictions? Number one, take your eyes off the create, creation and keep it on the creator. And you do that on a regular basis. How? By looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And number three, you constantly, every fear, every thought, bring it under the wisdom of God. And for that, you need to know. You need to know what's written in it. You need to know what you are entitled to. So you bring it, you bring that on, on a daily basis, day in and day forth and day in and day forth, till your very eyes see that the creation around you truly proclaims the glory of God. You know what happens when you constantly bring the word of God into your circumstances? You know, the Bible says in John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. And then fast forward to verse 4, 14, it says, and the word dwelt amongst us and became flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among men. That's what happens. When you bring in the word of God, you make God your center priority into any long battle or short battle that you're facing. You know, the beauty is that even though the Israelites got out, you know, like after that first generation, when the next generation, when they entered into the truly great environment which God had for them, there was not a smell of the Egyptians on them. They, it didn't even feel that they were with the Egyptians. That's what God can do. And that's why he says when you pass through the fire, you're not going to get burnt. The, the, the smell of smoke is not going to be upon you. You get it? So that is what I really wanted to share with you all to, today. Number one, associated assimilations. You become who you are associated with. You become what you are associated with. You are influenced by your environment. And like even though the environment has put in a lot of crazy stuff upon you, God is always waiting there with his abundance, magnificence to get you out. To just get you out in splendor and glory. 
And when he gets you out, you've got to practice his presence. Continue to live in victory. Continue to contradict your, your you know, continue to conquer all the situations which, which like contradict your life and your ways by just looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, bringing every thought under the subjection of the Holy Ghost and the Word of God, okay? And by constantly tapping into the wisdom of God. God bless you all.